Rezomo from Salvador, Brazil. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to participate in this beautiful event where we're discussing what it's like to be human now, right? Thank you. I would like to thank Marlene. I would like to thank Loving Arms Linked and all the team involved in making this event happen. I'm really honored with the invitation. And I would like to start with this deep sense of gratitude to be here, but also with the sense of responsibility as well. As last weekend, a couple of days ago, um, we reached the very sad mark of half a million Brazilians that passed away due to COVID-19. And I think it's important for us to mention because sometimes numbers can be a bit overwhelming for us. So remembering the dreams, the stories, the talents of these people who somehow cannot be with their families anymore and also acknowledging that as a country we are dealing with a collective grief of um, unprecedented power i think it's important to this topic that we're discussing here which is emotional literacy grief is something that um, shakes our emotions a lot and a collective grief is even more complex so i would like to start this talk acknowledging the importance of the moments that we're living in and the, the size of the, the sanitary and also ethics, moral crisis that we're dealing with. Um, in, in other areas, things are, aren't exactly easy as well. And I'll bring a little cut on the thing that I'm more closely related to right now, which is domestic violence and violence against women in general. The latest research in Brazil conducted by the Brazilian Public Safety Forum stated us that 4.3 million women in Brazil of 16 years or more have been physically assaulted during the pandemic which is approximately eight women per minute. So if you think about it, during the, the time of my talk, more than 100 women will be assaulted just in Brazil, just physically. Um, 5.9 million reported threats of physical violence. So that's just the threat, not the actual violence. It is a form of violence, but you understand. 3.7 million have suffered sexual violence. And if you cut in terms of profiling, the situation is much worse for young women, for divorced or separated women, and black women. So it, although the numbers are very powerful, some of us even call it the pandemic inside the pandemic, right? Um, it, it has a target more than, more than others. Um, more than 70% of the authors of violence are known to these women. And the worst case of aggression, 48.8%, the aggression happened inside the house. So home is not a place to be safe for many Brazilian women. And the pandemic um, made the situation even worse because the recommendation is for us to stay home. And, and things got a, a lot worse during the pandemic. So I, st I wanted to bring some hard data on the subject to acknowledge that if we don't take proper care of ourselves and those who are close to us and, and those who work with us, um, we may get a little overwhelmed and somewhat insensitive and we start thinking some things are normal. But the invitation of this talk, and I think most of what I can bring to this table is how do we not lose 
our humanity and how do we not get numbed by these kind of situations and why so when i got the invitation i thought what well, what could i share because many times the mind does this trick to us right you're insignificant your work is it changes the lives of women but it's not that much women so <laughs> why would you what could you share and and the process for me like to connect the dots and understand what led me here was really a, a, a chance for me to contemplate what it was like for me to find purpose or actually letting the purpose find me and and i think that's important to share from all that data of women that have been physically assaulted and the worst kind of aggression happening in the house and the, the aggression being known i've experienced it firsthand i grew up in a violent household and yeah i i need to share a little bit of my story to to connect on what happened for me to find the purpose um i was born in 1988 in salvador bahia which is an amazing city the blackest city outside africa and we're very proud of that um, it was also the city with the largest importation of human beings for three centuries it was the largest slave port for in the world for centuries so this it's really deep in, within our culture right um, and my family is not originally from here from both sides um, my parents are migrants and especially on my mom's side we come from this very hard place of Brazil, very dry and poor place of Brazil, where the option in the 60s and 70s was really to migrate to other cities to try to make a better living. Um, and everybody left with this very strong idea of working in whatever was possible to overcome what was a very humble and, and needy childhood right with very little money food etc big family um, but there was a lot of struggle let's say like that so even though they haven't finished their, their studies um, they were very lucky to have found in the brazilian public sector uh, the opportunity to uh, to achieve financial and professional stability and they and they worked very hard for us to have the best opportunities that we possibly could. And sometimes it, it felt like we weren't exactly living a life that was ours. Because when we looked at the family and, and close friends, we saw people who needed to work as young child. And we didn't. And it was very clear for me the kind of privilege that I was surrounded with and I started feeling very guilty about it and like if I didn't need to do anything else just study my obligation was to get like only straight A's or or do my best otherwise I felt like I wouldn't be honoring all the hard work that they were putting on and also um I, I, my sister and I have learned a little bit about um, what it's like to avoid conflict at all costs because we would never know when the bomb was going to explode. And we kind of remember some occurrences of the screams or the other noises and having to rush to our grandma's place or, or having to travel in a hurry. And it took us a while to understand the dynamics that was going on. But one thing I learned in my child sense was that when they were happy about my straight A's, they were not arguing. So I kind of assumed that if I was perfect, if I didn't fail, they wouldn't fight. So I, I started this very powerful narrative in my head that I needed to be perfect. I needed not to disappoint them. 
otherwise the bomb would explode and my mom would get hurt somehow and needless to say that it became a very deep bondage for me throughout my life and i felt this really interesting call like what what am i here to do it was very a very strong question for me since early, since early childhood what am i here to do and I had many opportunities to find some purpose in service activities, either in church or the spiritual center. Um, I would find myself very satisfied serving other people or studying something spiritual, right? And by the time I needed to choose a career, I remember looking and saying, none of the options available is really a career for me. I don't want to do any of that. I think, I think what I want to do has not been invented yet. And many teachers would agree, although I had the scores to go to a medical school or something, they, they said, yeah, you, you can't be like molded. <laughs> You're something else. So I chose the career that was more generic at the time, which was communications. And inside the communications um, school, I tried a little bit of everything. And I was able to, to travel, to visit other countries and find a lot of interesting worlds, the points of view. And one of the, one of the things that, that really caught my attention was that when I lived in, in Canada, I experienced living in a household that was highly respectful. And problems were dialogued. And even if there was a struggle, we would talk through it and, and get a solution. And that opened my eyes to the dynamic that I was living back home and how things could be different somehow. And, and when I understood that it had a name called domestic violence and, um, and it was like a social problem, it was not just my mom, but it's more frequent than we think, I got back to Brazil very emotional about it. And I remember when I was 15 years old, after one very uh, bad episode, I remember going, like taking the bus, 40 minutes to go to the police station. And when I got there, crying, beaten up, um, the, the police person looked at me and said, is your father black? And I said, no. He said, is he, has he gone to college? I said, no. And he said, he knows that if he goes to jail, he will be in the common area, right? Because here in Brazil, we have this thing. If you go to university, you go to a special kind of prison. You know that he might not come out alive, right? Would you be able to live with that? And at that time, I didn't know what to do. I, f I completely froze. And then he continued. He said, and you know that if he doesn't go to jail, that he could be even more aggressive with your mom, right? And I was like, this is a lose-lose situation, right? And at that time, at 15, I decided to go back home and try to figure out another way to, to deal with what was happening. And things went like a couple of years later, everything uh, sort of settled down. My mom was able to leave the house and, and get her own place and we came with her. But um, at, that was a moment where I really felt helpless And that gave me a deep sense of understanding of how helpless 
the victims are as well, because I was not the direct victim. And I felt completely unempowered in that situation. So imagine what what would be like for the victims. And it took me many years of therapy and spiritual quests to deal with all the all the anger and all the the feelings that arose with that kind of uh, experience and and emotional literacy has a lot to do with this kind of self-observation right labeling what you're feeling and accepting that um and a number of years later i was able to now work in the social sector and be able to work with domestic violence domestic um, domestic violence and it felt like lots of dots had connected back i do a quick pause here because i've already done a spoiler and i'll, I'll go back to 2010 when i graduated and i needed to figure out what i wanted to do and I received these emails talking about volunteering opportunities in India, more specifically in Varodra, near Ahmedabad, in Gujarat. And when India calls you, India calls you, right? So I needed this really deep call to go to India, to work there. And things kind of just happened. And a couple of months later, I was there and I worked for two NGOs that work with domestic violence. One worked with children and one worked, then that was the most amazing one. It was a women's trust of ladies who had been either widows or abandoned by their husbands or like it was a group of women who supported each other in a very patriarchal society in which if a woman didn't have the husband it had no value that was that the situation for that city back then and I learned so much from them and although we didn't speak the same language um, at one event where I saw them talking and, and the translator would tell us what was going on I understood the importance of civil society to, to help people deal with things that are overwhelming to them. Like the kind of support that they had was magical. And the transformation stories that we were able to, to do back then were really inspiring to me. And I have a really high respect for civil society um, programs, and, and that's why I, I needed, I decided to work on the social sector. So back to Brazil, I went back to the corporate sector actually for a number of years, and then decided to go and work on the social sector that I've, I thought was my calling. And what I didn't know was <laughs> it was the worst struggle of my life. Like to work with things that I was really passionate about, either construction or education or social impact, but um, getting really emotionally attached to it, right? Because when we are young, but I would say any anyone could go through that in any situation sometimes we think that we are what we do and for many years in the social sector i thought i was what i was doing so that that led to a number of things but the most critical one was a a series of anxiety crises because if somehow I thought that if I was not working, I had no value. And I needed to be busy all the time, just busy, busy, busy. And at one point, my anxiety got to a level that 
I said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I need to, I need to decide what to do. Either I'm going to the doctor and get prescriptions or, or I'll do some alternative thing. And it led me to trying this breathing course uh, for an organization led by uh, an Indian humanitarian. And it changed my life completely in the sense that I was able to find my own value besides everything that I did. And also gave me this really powerful technique, breathing technique, that helped me deal with the stress and really helped me looking at my emotions from, from a very calm and, and balanced way. So a lot of the things that I was experiencing was basically stress that I wasn't able to, to deal with. And long story short, I've been volunteering for these organizations for the last five years, and I have recently become an instructor. And one of the things that rewards me the most today is to be able to teach this technique and other breathing techniques and yoga to many people and help them find the comfort of dealing with their emotions without all that cortisol, without all their, all that stress. And I have been doing that for civil society, of course. I have been doing that to women who suffer violence. I have been doing that with activists. And I have also been involved in the program who does that to the police, which is very special for me in a number of ways. Not only because of the story that I told you, but also because I've been able to witness and study firsthand, that was the theme of my thesis, what it's like to have a police officer taking decisions with a calmer state of mind, what it's like for a commanding unit to have 100% of the staff trained and how it changes the interpersonal relationships, how it changes the stigma of mental health, how it opens the doors for people to ask help when they need or avoiding people just to take their lives, right? Because that's what lots of people who can't ask for help do. So, um, it's really been life changing in a number of ways. And I bring a lot of that knowledge and a lot of that wisdom to the work that I currently do with, the, with activists from all over Brazil who have either projects or ideas of how to deal with um, domestic violence. And a lot of these women are located in cities that are super small or medium sized, where sometimes you don't have a specific police station for domestic violence, or you don't have the proper network to deal with uh, everything that's that happens. So they need to do their emotional work as well, because they are under a lot of stress. They are faced with very challenging situations. Um, the cases can be very brutal in a daily basis. So being able to guide them through this journey of looking, what are my values? What am I doing this? What do I need to do to intervene in this reality? What is the change that I want to do? But what is the kind of internal conditions that I have to make this intervention? What is driving me? What's stopping me? Am I putting my expectations on her or am I able to really listen with 100%? Am I able to connect? Am I able to establish limits when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the triggers that are triggered when, when a woman tells me the aggression and what she's been going through? Anyways, uh, so I think dealing with stress 
dealing with our ability to to pass through life and not get the event hit us this hard has been really crucial for me to be able to support women volunteers activists all all the places that i work with not work for but all the people that i work with um and there is this beautiful quote from this humanitarian leader that touches me a lot that i think has a lot to do with the things that we're discussing here today there is a song deep inside you until that time that you can sing that song that you have come on stage to sing you will be restless it doesn't matter if you feel a little out of tune for a minute or two go ahead sing and i think my story of restlessness before today when i look back was just life trying to show me the way and all the the fact that my path is really mixed with ancient knowledge and and this deep sense of um understanding that i'm not important at all and it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't need to be all right all the time um people fail like really taking taking myself all that perfectionism out of the way and and taking the expectations out of the way and just be present sometimes the largest impact we can have on people is to be present for them and and it's not easy to be present in a world where we're under so many stimulus right right now my my timer is about to <laughs> it's about to tick so we are under a lot of stimulus all the time and i really wonder what would our educational systems look like or our society would look like if we learned from an early age how to nurture our presence if we learned how to be 100%, if we learned how to deal with our stress, if we learned to look at what we are experiencing as people, as women, as society, and be able to label it correctly, communicate it correctly, like, and understand that feelings come and go, and we don't need to get too much entangled with it, I think um, that would be a great contribution. And I think the Parenting 2.0 discussions have a lot to do with um, what kind of changes we want to bring to the future generations, right? To the current and future generations. And that's part of the discussions that I love to be involved with. Um, being part of the late phase of like the consequences of not having emotional literacy really makes me sensitive on what we need to do before things get too late well, things get too bad let's say um and i would like to end my my speech with a very beautiful quote saying when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. <laughs> so that's it. To whoever's listening that, that struggles with this, this theme of finding, finding purpose, like rushing to find a purpose or, or thinking that your purpose is linked with what you do or what you build or what you fund. Um, hopefully my story helps to see that it's not necessarily so sometimes your purpose is just to be a better human being and be happy no matter what happens be happy have a, an unshakable smile and with that unshakable smile that takes a lot of internal work we can really help uplift people who are next to us Hope it made sense. 
and I'm available to discuss whenever you want. I think we'll share my contacts, so I'm available. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this beautiful afternoon with you.